Please remain standing as we read from God's Word together. Uh, Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 36, 46. Gospel of Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 46. Luke 1, starting at verse 46, ESV, hear the words of the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. These are God's holy an inerrant word. You may be seated. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Y'all remember that? Who's old enough? Amen. 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 There are moments in life that are big moments. Moments when our hearts are so full that we're compelled to respond. This response can look different from person to person, and this moment can look different from moment to moment, or this response can look different from moment to moment. Some might respond with a shout. I've watched probably more than my fair share of a show called Ninja Warrior, because that's what I want my body to look like. A common shout that you'll hear if you've seen the show is, let's go! Once they hit the top of the warped walls, like 15 feet or something like that. Or maybe Ninja Warrior isn't your thing. Maybe you played soccer or you watch soccer. And if you watch soccer, a common shout that you might see there is, go! If you go to a Mississippi State with football game, you might hear something else from Matt Clark because he knows all the chants, all the shouts. But shouting isn't the only response that you can get when one is experiencing big moments. Sometimes those big moments may come with tears. Sometimes tears of joy. Sometimes tears of sorrow. Whatever the response, the point is that moments have the ability to move you. It was in one of these moments that a young lady named Mary found herself. In the Gospel of Luke, we read a passage about a teenage girl living in a small, ordinary town who was chosen for an extraordinary purpose. She didn't expect it. She didn't ask for it. But when the angel Gabriel announced that she would be the mother of the Savior, something happened on the inside of Mary. And her spirit was so moved, her heart so filled with awe and gratitude that she burst into a song of praise that has echoed throughout the ages. This morning, our assignment is to look at Mary's song of praise, also known as the Magnificat. As we look at our text this morning, this song, I want to point our hearts to three things. Praise for God's might. Praise for God's mercy. And praise for God's faithfulness. Y'all, excuse me, for whatever reason this morning, my mouth is exceedingly dry. But Mary's song is an invitation for us today. 
an invitation to see God as he truly is, to respond to him with our whole heart and to join in the song, that Mary's song, that has been sung through generations of believers. It's an invitation to lift our voices and our lives to sing of a God and to a God who loves us, who sees us, and who calls us to be a part of his redemptive plan. So this morning, all of you are officially members of the praise team. Amen. Look with me at the first few verses as we consider praise for God's might. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in my God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Mary begins her song with a declaration. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. It's important that we understand that Mary is not magnifying the Lord as if to make him great or to make him greater. God is already great and all by himself, he is infinitely great. So when Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, she is magnifying the Lord in her own heart. Too often in moments where we're unclear on the why and how of what God is doing, we tend to make him more like us. That is to say, we, we tend to limit him. If we don't understand, if we can't see it, surely this is not something that God can do. We see Sarah and Abraham limiting God when they were unclear how God would give them a child after all these years. And rather than magnifying the Lord, they diminished the Lord saying perhaps it's through Hagar that the Lord would deliver the promise of an heir. And out of their help came a problem rather than a promise. But Mary isn't relegating God to her circumstances, but rather she is elevating him above her circumstances. My soul magnifies the Lord. Although she can't see it, yet she believes that God is able to do it. And because she believes, notice how quickly she shifts the focus from herself to God. Yes, her soul magnifies the Lord. Yes, she rejoices in God, her Savior, but her praise is not centered on her own circumstances, but on the mighty works of God. Her praise, her making much of God, her magnifying God, her rejoicing in God from verses 46 and 47 were all in response to what God had done in verses 48 and 49. For he looked on the humble estate of his servant. For, beho for, for behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who, is, he who is mighty has done great things for me. This statement is more than an acknowledgement of God's blessings. It's an expression of awe at the power and might of God. Mary is praising God for his might, for his dunatus. Strong's number 1415, it's an adjective describing something that was made possible because of the power or ability exerted by the subject. The subject that Mary's speaking of here is God. As Mary sings, for he is mighty who has done great things for me, she is acknowledging the fact that he's able to do and has done the impossible. You see, this young woman was not of noble status, not particularly important in the world's eyes. And to make matters worse, she's a young woman betrothed to a man she has not yet known for a marriage that has not yet been consummated, and yet she's pregnant. The lack of nobility added to the scandal of her current condition meant that it was impossible for her life to be anything but ordinary. 
But Mary gets to experience firsthand that God's might isn't limited by her circumstances. His might, his dunatus makes the impossible possible. And the life of this ordinary young woman was forever changed because she was chosen by God to be a part of his extraordinary and great redemptive plan, not just for Mary, but for generations that would come after her and join her in her song of praise. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. When was the last time you paused and gave God praise simply because he is mighty? Simply because of who he is. When was the last time you paused to praise God because he is powerful? Because he has done things that you could never do on your own. It is sadly all too easy for us to forget that God who created the universe, who parted the Red Sea, who brought down the walls of Jericho, and who raised Jesus from the dead is still working today. And that he's working in our lives. God is still mighty. He is still doing great things. In the Psalms, David repeatedly praises God for his mighty works. In Psalm 145, verses 3 through 4, David writes, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. David understood that God's greatness is beyond his comprehension. And that his mighty acts deserve to be declared from one generation to the next. And just as David did, Mary recognized that God's mighty works weren't just for the past. She saw that God was continuing to act in her present and that through her, he would touch generations. And she responded with praise. And this is a call for us to join the chorus. We're not just praising God or a God who did great things thousands of years ago. We're praising a God who is mighty still. This thing is giving me fits. We're praising a God who is mighty still and still working and still able to do the impossible even in our day. No matter how seemingly ordinary, Charles Spurgeon is quoted as having said, we cannot always trace God's hand, but we can always trust his heart. Mary didn't fully understand everything that was happening in her life, but she trusted God's heart and surrendered to the word of his will and the might of his hand. And she again responded with praise. She magnified the Lord because she knew That he was greater than any circumstance, greater than any fear or lack of understanding, greater than any obstacle. Are we magnifying the Lord for his mighty works today? Are we taking time to reflect on his power and recognize the ways that he's working in your life, your family, your community? In all of our knowledge about God, is there room for God to be God? Mary's song of praise is an invitation to lift our eyes from the challenges and to set them firmly on our champion that we might see the greatness of our God. Look with me at verse 50 as we continue in Mary's song. And his mercy is for generations, for those, excuse me, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their thoughts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones. He has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. As Mary continues her song, we see a shift from her praising God for his might at work in her personal life to praising God for his communal mercy in the lives of those who fear him. 
In verse 50, she sings, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary's praise for God's mercy reveals something profound about his character and gives us all the more reason to praise our God. He is not simply a mighty God. He is a compassionate God who extends mercy to those who seek him. The praise here is not about Mary's worthiness, nor is it about our worthiness. Scripture speaking concerning our worthiness in Isaiah 64 and 6 saying, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind takes us away. The praise is about God about his willingness to show mercy and kindness to the humble, to the broken, to the needy. And I don't know, I don't know about you, but it's easy to get caught up, whether consciously or unconsciously, to think or feel as if we somehow have to earn God's mercy. But Mary's song reminds us that God's mercy is freely given to those who fear him to those who recognize their need for him from generation to generation. And this is the very heart of the gospel, that while we were still sinners, still enemies of God, still walking in our own way, still dead in our sins, Christ died for us. Romans 5, verse 8. It's not about our goodness, but it's about his grace, his mercy. Scripture says in John 1, verses 12 through 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man, but of God. This means no matter what you've done or how many times you've done it or how far you feel you may have strayed for those who fear God, who reverence God, who look at him and see who he is and how great his love and grace is for us. God's mercy is always available. It is mercy that fills the hungry with good things. It's mercy that lifts up the lowly and mercy that brings hope to the hopeless. It's mercy that puts on display the strength of his arm that scatters the proud. In Isaiah 59, the word says, indeed, the, arm, the Lord's arm is not weak, too weak that it cannot save. And his ear is not too deaf to hear. We also see the theme of mercy again in Lamentations 3, verses 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Why does Mary... Why does Mary sing praise for his faithfulness? Because God's ability to give mercy rises to meet our need for mercy and indeed surpasses it, according to Romans 5. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A.W. Tozer said concerning mercy, when Jesus died on the cross, the mercy of God did not become greater. It could not become any greater, for it was already infinite. We get the odd notion that God is showing mercy because Jesus died. No, Jesus died because God is showing mercy. It was the mercy of God that gave us Calvary and not Calvary that gave us mercy. If God had not been merciful, there would be no incarnation, no babe in the manger, no man on a cross, and no empty tomb. And so for his mercy, Mary sings. And as Mary sings praises for God's mercy, let us examine our own need for mercy. And let us examine how we respond to others who are in need of mercy. As the might of God and the mercy of God fills Mary's heart, she finds herself incapable of keep keeping such good news to herself. God's mercy is for generations. 
are we willing to extend the same mercy to others that God has extended to us? We're quick to cut people off. Are we willing to be instruments of his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness? When we praise God for his mercy, we are reminded that we are not only recipients of his mercy, but we are called to be vessels of his mercy. 2 Corinthians 5, a familiar passage here, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, through, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's mercy. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Again, that is mercy. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That is mercy. Amen. And we are called to be vessels of mercy. When we understand the depths of God's mercy that we have received, God's praise becomes more than just words. It's something that shows up in our lives. It becomes a reflection of God's character in the way that we treat others, the way that we forgive, and the way that we love. Theologian John Calvin was, once said, we shall never be clothed with the righteousness of Christ except we first know assuredly that we have no righteousness of our own. It's God's mercy that clothes us, that covers us, and that compels us to live lives of praise. And we can only live this way because God is faithful. Look with me at the last set of verses, starting with 54. Praise for God's faithfulness. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. The final aspect of Mary's praise is rooted in God's faithfulness. She sings in verses 54 and 55 that he has helped his servant Israel in remembering his mercy in remembering the covenant that he spoke to Abraham and to his offspring. Here Mary is declaring that God's actions in her life are part of a much larger story, a story of promises made and promises kept. God's faithfulness is one of the most beautiful and reassuring aspects of his character. Throughout Scripture, we see a God who makes promises and keeps them, a God who never forgets his people. From the covenant that he made with Abraham to the promise of a Messiah, God has always been faithful to his word. And Mary's song celebrates that unchanging faithfulness. In Psalms, we read about God's faithfulness over and over. Psalm 100 verse 5 declares, The Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. This is the God we praise, a God whose faithfulness is not limited by time, by circumstances, or by our failure. Mary recognized that her story was woven into God's greater narrative of faithfulness. She saw that God's promise to Abraham was being fulfilled in the child, through the child she was now carrying. She praised God. Not just for what he was doing in her life, but for what he had done throughout history and for what he was going to do through the generations. This is a powerful reminder for us. Our praise is not just about our own experience. It's about recognizing that we are part of a much bigger story. It's about remembering that God has been faithful to his word in the past. He is faithful to his word now, and he will continue to be faithful. Hebrews 10, 23, echoing this fact, encourages us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And I want to acknowledge how challenging this can be. 
I've not seen or spoken to Gabriel or any other angel that I'm aware of who came and gave me a, a, a playbook on what God was looking to do in my life. I don't know how hunger or heartbreak is working in me to bring about God's glory or, or how brokenness in me is putting beauty on display for someone else. I don't know how my utility is being turned off or how pain or sickness in my body fits into God's redemptive work, but I know that Romans 8 says all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. I know that Paul gives us a powerful lesson in Philippians chapter 4 as he said, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Praising God without knowing or seeing the end is a thing, excuse me, praising God without knowing and seeing the end of a thing is us learning to trust in God's faithfulness. As we praise him, we're reminded that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises are sure. His love is steadfast. His faithfulness endures. He is that word again to all generations. From the moment he called Abraham and promised to make him a great nation to the fulfillment of that promise that we see here in Mary, pregnant with the coming Christ, God has been unwavering in his commitment to his people. Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise, every prophecy, every hope. Through him we see that God's faithfulness is not just in a concept but in a person. So when we face challenges or when we feel like life is uncertain, when we're tempted to doubt, we can hold to the fact that God has never failed and he never will. We can praise him in advance for the prophecies, promises yet to be fulfilled, knowing that his word will never return to him void. Prophet Isaiah says in Chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. As we, as we leave this place, reflecting on Mary's song, let us be reminded that it isn't just something that we do on Sunday morning. Praise. Not something that we just do on Sunday mornings. It is our moment by moment response to who God is. Not necessarily just what He's doing, but who He is. It's a recognition of His mighty works, His endless mercy, and His unwavering faithfulness. So, in closing, how do we join? the chorus alongside Mary and the generations in a song of praise that points others to God's might, his mercy, and his faithfulness. We begin as Mary did. My soul magnifies the Lord. Again, I want you to get this is not Mary making God great. He is who he is. And he is the I am. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. This is not Mary making God bigger. This is Mary moving anything and everything aside that would keep her from trusting God and receiving what was spoken, spoken over her. Jonathan Reynolds has a song called Make Room, in which he says, I will make room for you, speaking of God. I will prepare for two. It's me and God, so that you don't feel like you can't live here. Please live in me. As Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord. She is making room for God to be God in her life. She's pushing aside fear. She's pushing aside any lack of understanding. She's pushing aside what other people will have to say about what God is calling her to. We have to make room in our heads and our hearts for God to be God. Can you imagine Noah 
building the ark, telling people that it's going to rain when it had never rained on the earth? Noah had to make room for God to be God in order to obey God. So we have to push aside our fear. We have to push aside our anxiety. We have to push aside our doubts. Magnify the Lord. Praise is the means by which he properly comes into focus. With God in proper focus, now our faith in him is in the foreground and everything else is pushed to the background. We see him better. And when we see him better, we see him as bigger. Bigger than everything else. And everything else begins to fade. Now, I want you to hear me. We're not saying that your problems go away. Amen. Just because God is magnified, we're not making him greater. We're making him greater in our hearts, in our eyes. We're exercising our faith. But this doesn't mean that problems go away. This simply means that we are trusting God to be God. You remember the three Hebrew boys when they were threatened to be thrown into the furnace and they said, look, our God is well able to deliver. But even if he doesn't, this is, this is the posture of praise. This is the posture of Mary. She knew that she was going to be facing obstacles, hardship as a result of what God had spoken over her. But she set her face like a flint to God's promise, to God's word. If you've been here for some time, you've probably heard it said many times that life is tragic, but God is faithful. So just because you live a life of praise, just because you are setting God, making him bigger, making room for him to be God in your life doesn't mean life is going to be perfect. Trouble you will have in the world, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Amen. Simply means that you are learning to trust God in everything. In everything. In times of joy, in times of triumph, in times of sadness and in times of great need. Take time to reflect on his mighty works, his mercy, and his faithfulness. And as you do, let your praise become a testimony to those around you, a declaration that God is worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise. May our souls magnify the Lord and may our spirits rejoice in our God, our Savior. Let us pray.